real freedom does come from this internal place and to see someone like just whim just like being like a free person there is an element of a it's a reminder welcome to the stage nicholas Bailey. how do i serve the tribe what can i do what's the next thing i can do most unselfish thing a person could do is expand no other option besides hard work how they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle YouTube, what's going on? Nicholas Bailey here. I have an absolutely amazing episode with someone who studied underneath people like Wim Hof and the Gracie family when it came to jiu-jitsu, learning about breath work, how it can completely change your state, have emotional releases, have massive breakthroughs, as well as getting into an unlimited, seemingly an unlimited amount of cold water. We're talking this guy freaking hiked with shorts and shoes up Mount Everest and taught this guy that I brought in here today. He's also going to be speaking at BDB Live. So if you've not grabbed your ticket for BDB Live yet, you can do it down in the uh, see more section inside the description. Also, if you're listening and all of a sudden, finally, then you go, I need to meet this guy. Then you can go grab your ticket at BDBLive.com. Now, with that, I want to welcome my friend, again, who studied underneath the Gracie family, who studied underneath Wim Hof, is a certified Wim Hof instructor, just did a four-hour workshop with our guys that was so transformative. We're talking inside of marriage and personal life, and will be for you, too. Welcome, my friend, Joey House. Joey, welcome to the BDB Podcast, man. Yeah, very excited to be here. I'm not going to lie, the first thing that I thought of was Joe Biden when I just said your name. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, because he always goes, I always ha have, when I watch his campaign, he always said, and my dad said to me, Joey, <laughs> and I will keep that in the podcast because it was just absolutely hilarious. Yeah, but anyway, man, not? it's awesome to have you here. Uh, we actually just got done with a double big mansion retreat over Florida. Yeah. And one of the cool things from that, that you probably saw from some of the messages you've got or some of the conversations from some of the guys have been joining like your breathwork sessions and stuff is that they said that was one of the most impactful things. And we had a few crazy things happen with weather and speakers. We were in a tropical storm, which ended up not being that crazy. Yet Plains thinks it's, thinks it's crazy. And they were like, man, I'm so glad that he wasn't one of the speakers that missed out. And no offense to the other speakers, they didn't get a chance to prove themselves. Sure. Yet it was so impactful for them what we went through in that four hours or so, leading all the way into like 12 hours later into the middle of the night, that it was so impactful for them that that was like the things that they were saying. So after that, I was like, man, not only do I have to get this guy to come to BDB live, I also wanted to do an interview here where we kind of jump into some stuff, almost pre-gaming for the live event, sure. some more stuff that you'll be able to teach in that group capacity. But I just want to honor you and thank you for being there. And then also the transformation that occurred there as well. Yeah, it was a really cool experience getting to be with all the guys over there in Florida. And yeah, like I definitely felt that it, like it definitely... Like what I love about doing like the breath work and the ice bath and so many different kinds of scenarios is that it, it brings about different kinds of conversations. It opens people up in these really unique ways. And yeah, like the group that you already had there, I can tell was already very opened up. And so it could kind of brought on a whole new layer. And it was really cool to see that. That's awesome, man. So uh, I have so many questions that I'm even thinking of as you're talking before I even get there, because I'm, I'm interested as well. Tell me the path that you went down to discover what you do now. And, and what you do now isn't just in Wim Hof method. Like you have your own things that you've kind of, you've taken from the best in the world. Yeah. Yet I want to hear like your journey to discover the thing that you do now, just to get a little bit more context on everything. Yeah. I felt like I've always been a seeker of some kind of sort. I always felt like in school, uh, I never really cared for it. I was always like a DF student. And a part of me always felt that I was, oh, maybe I'm lazy. But then I discovered wrestling, which is probably the hardest sport that any high school kid can do. And I loved it. I loved how hard and how intense it was. And I loved just like the different aspects about myself that it brought forward. I loved how like a part of my brain wanted to quit, but I can see myself continuing on, even though my brain wanted to quit for a split second, and then to see how deep that can go. And then, yeah, I remember like after I was done wrestling in college, I went to the Marines, still kind of seeking out that, like how deep can I take my body and kind of like excelled there as well. And then found jujitsu. And then within jujitsu, I feel that kind of, 
it got like this softer approach because jujitsu and wrestling very similar, but also kind of different, especially if you look at the mentality of wrestlers and people in the jujitsu world where wrestlers are kind of this grind, make it happen at all costs, kind of like that, like a blue collar mentality, which is beautiful. Like I love that I got to develop that within wrestling and the Marines, but then jujitsu kind of had this bigger like spiritual aspect to it. And it wasn't until Hicks and Gracie came and did a seminar and Hicks and Gracie, I always joke is like this, it's like this biblical character. He's this person that like, isn't normal, like undefeated in hundreds of jujitsu matches, undefeated in MMA, winning everything by submission. Even like his aura, if you're ever around him, it's like, oh, this is a, it's a person I should be listening to every word that comes out of his mouth and talked a lot about the importance of breath work when he taught a seminar at the academy I train at. And I remember being enthralled because breath work is a thing in case, unless you come into contact with it, it's one of those things that you don't realize, oh, maybe I should be learning how to use my breathing in a more optimal way. But then all of a sudden here's this guy, Hicks and Gracie, he's here to teach us jujitsu, but he's actually like, no, 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 breathing is the thing. Let me tell you about breathing. And I remember like, that's insane that this is just but like, all right, I want to learn more. And I came and learned more synchronicities came. I a yogi came and lived with me for six months that actually learned under the same guy that Hicks and Gracie learned under. And he taught me all these different breathing techniques, just like Hickson also does cold immersion. So I did that too. And so all these things that kind of were lined up with the Wim Hof method before I even knew who Wim Hof was. So then I see him and it's, oh, I'm already doing this. I'm already working on these breathing techniques. I'm already doing cold immersion. But then with Wim Hof, I saw somebody who's doing it like, A, he's bringing it to science and showing here are all the health benefits. This is what's going on. But also just like this ability to do it and be not phased by, by the cold. I was like, I want to learn how to do more of that. And then like, that's like what I've been teaching as far as the Wim Hof method goes. But as we were talking about earlier, I've definitely been involved in a much bigger, broader spiritual community that there's plant medicines involved, all sorts of different tools of seekers that kind of do show like other layers of the, you can call this the matrix or whatever you want to call it, but kind of show, oh, there's, there's more, there's definitely more than our eyes can see, our ears can hear. And I've been just fascinated in going as deep down that rabbit hole as possible. So what's interesting is you've obviously spent time with both of these guys from Gracie to Wim Hof. And when it comes to, let's go Gracie first, like what are some of the things that you learned just from being in proximity or just being around? Because there's things that we hear people teach yeah. and then there's things that we pick up on that people do and we go, oh, that's interesting. Like I want to do more of that. And I just came back from a trip even I was telling you about. Yeah. And I have a few of those moments where I saw one of my friends do something that they would probably never teach. They don't even notice that they do them. Yeah. But I go, I like that. Like, I'm going to pick that up and, and try that on for myself. And, and so I was just talking to Amanda about it. What were some of the things that you noticed they either taught or did that you picked up on? That's so interesting that you say, because as you ask the question, it's like I immediately realize a thing that I do that was picked up from him. And like where in my workshops, I do try to make it a point to remember everybody's name especially if it's like within a certain capacity like once we start getting like 100 200 people it becomes very difficult but within like 50 people i've gotten pretty good at doing that and remember when hickson came to like his seminar there was probably close to 100 people on the mat and he didn't learn everybody's name but before he came in and taught the seminar he built it was like a little connection with every person he shook everyone's hand like but like looked you in the eye and like said something, it was like always like a small thing, but it, there felt like it was like there was a connection made there. It wasn't that just that he was, all right, I'm here, I'm going to teach this room of people, but I'm teaching you the individual, you the individual, but that, that connection was made with every person. And it seemed like that was an important thing to him. Uh, and yeah, it was like a thing that I remember resonating with me that for like even just a split second of a bit of a handshake and eye contact of like, oh, like this guy cares. And I remember, yeah, wanting to exude uh, an element of that. And it's like, oh yeah, like I, like I brought a part of that to me in the little things that I do. But yeah, like little things like that, this like, oh, like the connection with all the people in the room, that was very important. 
I've noticed that you do that. And it's interesting that it was learned from that one person. I even with fatherhood, there was a person who did that to me. And it made me realize the importance of being seen. Because obviously, like we get taught in from religious scriptures to probably even like spiritual teachers. Like I had a girl over at my house that just interviewed me the other day, Amanda, who just shaved her head, like long, luscious hair and shaved her head for years to like get rid of that part. And then there's a lot of stuff around like not being boastful or showing parts of who you are, you're giving, don't let your left hand see your right hand do it and all these things. Yet there's also this level of maturity that if you share that stuff, it has the ability to set an example for someone else. Like if you didn't notice those things or get taught that stuff, you probably would have never even thought about doing that at your seminars, but you saw how it impacted you. Luckily there, you picked it up. Uh, But I always say a quote that's like, if, if he didn't share that with you, then he would still be a great aura filled, deep connected person. You just wouldn't have had the opportunity to also go and try that on for size and try it as well. Kind of like if someone ran a four minute mile and no one knew, no one would know it's possible. But now that someone did it, everyone's like now high school kids can run a four minute mile. It's crazy. So Roger Bannister effect is a real thing. A hundred, I mean, a million percent. Like it's like the ability to discover something new is very difficult. But once you see something new, it becomes very easy to do. It's like yeah. inventing a light bulb, putting one together now for someone. Probably anyone could do it with instructions. Yeah. But it was very difficult the very first time, I can tell you that. So now going to Wim Hof, you spent some time around him. What has that experience been like? So like with Wim, he's, I always say he's like the freest person I've ever met. I've been around a lot of like, yeah, spirit, people that care about spirituality, people that care about money, like you look at Tony Robbins, like within the personal development world, abundance is a really real thing. Uh, but I also look at some of these people and it's like, yeah, but if you took away all their money, they'd be upset about it. Like, sure, like there'd be like the inner understanding, like, oh, I can always make that money back. But there would be a moment of like my money and whim, I see 0% of that. If he had zero money, he'd be like, oh, like he would swim in the the cold river like nearby it wouldn't he wouldn't be phased by like these kind of worldly things and you can really sense that being around him it's not like he's just talking about it you can tell here's this person not uh like not living of like the material aspects of this world is clearly somewhere else keep keep that keep that yeah what is that like being around someone like that i remember one of my first mentors i just noticed that the way he looked at money was different Mm-hmm. Not saying that he didn't like it or any of those things, yeah. not as far off as Wim Hof. Yet one thing I noticed from him is that like, he didn't care if, like I knew that if I paid him for anything, it was that feeling of it didn't really matter to him. And ever since then, that was something that deeply impacted me. I was like, you know what? Like, I don't want to live a life where I, other people feel like I need something from them in that capacity. Like, oh, yeah. I need this to make sure that we pay for our house or whatever. And I realized that that really attracted me to that person that he didn't need anything. You know what I mean? So what was that like or what has that been like with Wim being that way? What What's the experience like around him? What, what are you getting from that? Or what does it feel like? Is it just like, it's like this level of inner freedom, like the recognition that like freedom, like the only, like it only really exists on an internal plane and everything external. We talk about America, all these beautiful things, but as soon as you start sharing space with other people, little bits of rules need to kind of come into play to make sure that there's order, but real freedom does come from this internal place. And to see someone like just win, just like being like a free person, there is an element of a, it's a reminder. It's this, like you, you can feel it as like they feel it in them. Maybe it's like an empathic thing where some people kind of exude a thing like, oh, like I feel what's going on there. But with Wim, there is this feeling of, oh, you are, you are a, an actual free person. And it's like Have a you very ever seen thing. him underneath like pressure outside of the cold waters, like stressed out or or overwhelmed. Like, have you seen a chink? They say like never get to know your heroes because when course, you do, you're yeah. like just regular people. Have you have you seen that humanity in him where you go, oh wow, like he's normal? You know, like, so, oh, that's well, weird. No, because I think that. Most people like, it's like, oh, like I'm late for this thing and that can affect how much money I make or I'm like, and with when there's none of that. When we were in Poland, there was a time where all the instructors and all the participants 
were in the room. So it was 100 participants, about 15, 20 instructors, and like whim was supposed to be there and there's no whim. And all the instructors are like, oh, like, what are we going to do? Like, we brought them in here because Wim was going to give this talk. And so we were finding various ways to keep these 100 people occupied and entertained. And Wim comes in 30 minutes late, just like pushes the doors open, and he's soaking wet. He was wearing a poncho and a pair of, like, shorts, but just drenched. And he's like, hello, everybody, and just... Just nothing phased him. There was nobody like, hey, dude, you're running late. This is going to be problematic. There was no, that didn't exist within him. It was just in the moment beforehand, he felt like going for a swim in a local river. And then he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to go and talk to these people. But there was no worry in the other way and talked. And then during the talk, takes his shorts off underneath the poncho and he's throwing kicks and everything, just totally free not worried about how does this, how is this going to make me look? How am I going to appear here? That there was this, this freedom within him, this childlike innocence that just like, that's where he moved and operated from. So I've seen a video online of his son though. And I think this was from a similar time that you were with Wim. And they, a group of people had asked him, why don't you participate in any of this stuff? Like the breathing, the water and all this stuff. And it was very interesting to hear that it was because he feels that his traumas, and I don't know which son or any of these things, I'm, I'm just vaguely remembering this, that his traumas, his insecurities, all these things that he would possibly let go of and become more like Wim or, yeah. or like some of these other people, that that's what's making their family business grow. He's like, I wouldn't be as successful. I wouldn't make as much money. I wouldn't have as much drive. And I'm so scared to let go of that that I'm going to not do all these things that my dad teaches. Cause he's almost, he's yeah. probably looking at his dad going, well, if I was, if everyone was like you, none of this stuff would work. You know, yeah. where's the balance of that? Have you met, have you, do you know yeah. I'm talking so about? I, it's his son. I'm assuming it's Enum. Enum is the one that d d created the, the whole uh, business around the Wim Hof method. And I do think that once again, like I think Wim was completely content going for these world records, just kind of wanting to show the world, Hey, you know, you can, influence your own inner happiness, right? You know, you can influence your own level of health, your own immune system. I think he was just so passionate about teaching that, which is why he then climbed Everest in just shorts and shoes. He did like all these crazy things. And it was his son that built the business around that. And so like for like when, like, yeah, there seems to be zero things like, yeah, we could do this, but that might affect the following. Like you can see that that's not that's not in him, like just in his regular interactions with people, he is completely who he is. And it seems that like there's no external thing that's like, yeah, like my inner drive wants to go in that direction, but that might affect the business, the money, the influence. And you can, like, it seems that that's not there within him. And it seems that like Enum was very good at building the business around it. And I do think it takes a completely different mentality to build businesses to do different things that I don't think that was ever whims path but it was like that he was able to have one built around him based on how free he was and showing people oh you can access a level of this as well I think that's where he just really stands out that's where he shines but there was still a level of achievement that whim went for with like even though maybe money which is just one type of achievement or like yeah. one measuring stick to go by. He also hiked Mount Everest with shorts and shoes. Of course. Yeah. So it's like, he didn't need to do that. He could have just like gone, uh, you know what? I wonder what his internal motivation was for that. If he's not like influenced by all these things, like to show people that, what, you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. pretty interesting. I, we I all just, have that I, like little bit inside of us. Yeah. That's because like we're, we're interconnected beings. There's like a drive to, oh, I discovered something. I want to share this. I love doing what I do. And I think it's awesome that I get to make money doing it. But my like my drive in doing it is like, yo, everyone, check this out. You get to do this kind. All you got to do is breathe in this way. And you're going to discover aspects about yourself. Because it's just, I did that for myself. I was like, yo, this is cool. I want to share this with people. And I think Wynn just discovered it in this kind of, way that's different than other people discovered it his was more like a an inner like oh like let me let me go in this direction and i think it's all been just about showing people hey i can do this and i get like that 
Like there is a thing of, especially as like men wanting to achieve things, climbing Mount Everest is like a giant metaphor for that. Um, but yeah, like I do feel it came from a drive to share what's possible within like this human being. Like, hey, we're capable of a lot. Check this out. If I can do it, anyone can do it. So it must have been interesting watching the dynamic of those two. I don't know if his son was there when you were hanging out with, with Wim. Oh, he wasn't. Okay. Uh, just because I'd love to see that dynamic because there's there's always like, I always look at from the closest in. A lot of times people can influence many people outside the walls of their house. Of and I can manipulate what people see pretty easily from my own house. You create a whole character, be a whole different person than you are in, in real life. Yeah. And so then I really, I like to look at how can I be influential to the people that are closest to me? Because those are the hardest ones. There's even a quote that says, Jesus wasn't a prophet in his hometown. No one gave a crap about him, basically. <laughs> there, this, this kid that grew up here, like in this crappy town, is somehow this big deal. Like, okay. And so I've always taken that as, okay, I, I really care about me loving myself having influence on my family or my family loves me. I'm impacting my son currently and, and my wife and then my f- extended family and kind of rippling out and having less importance on way out there. Cause I, it's yeah. tough to really know. And with that, I, I look at someone like, let's say a hated person to, that people think is hated. At least I don't know if he actually is Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. A lot of his kids really like him now, whether it's like they're, got their hand tied behind their back or something but generally they write books about him they really like him and for me i go oh respect like that's hard thing to do it's easy to get everyone out there to either love or hate you well a whole different story for your kids uh i don't did you pick up on any of that from having polar opposite kids like how is when as a dad did you see any of that like so he's with his daughter yeah his uh his daughter um isabel like ran all the instructor things and yeah, like it was a very like fun dynamic between them. And so, cause I said, it's a whole family business and like, I know Laura does stuff, Isabel does stuff. And then Enum, I know kind of like built the whole business. And like, I do think that uh, like, it was like a thing based on like love. It was like this, like, oh, look what dad's doing. He's like, because of like, I know Laura and Isabel's daughters are also both instructors. They both teach the breath work. They both teach like the cold immersion. They're both all about it. And it doesn't feel like, uh, like, you know, just like, oh, like this is dad's business, whatever, I guess we'll do it. It seems that they were really, wow, this is helping people. Uh, let's help cool. people part of it. Yeah. And so it's been a, it's been a cool thing to see, but yeah, I've only seen from the daughters. I've seen Ian, I'm like on podcasts and things like that. Um, He's too busy yeah. working, man. He can't be in there like sitting yes. in ice, ice baths or something. Yeah. But no, it's like, it's a cool thing. And I love that you brought that up. Like the, uh, yeah, like, cause it is a different thing influencing your, like your direct family for a long time. Like my parents uh, think like what I do is nuts. <laughs> like, you know, going around the world, putting people in ice baths. Um, and actually just last week at uh, mine and my wife's uh, first year anniversary, cause we did a COVID wedding. And so uh, like a couple weeks ago, we did our one year anniversary where we brought like our family, our close friends had some extended family there as well. And the day before we brought my immediate family and my friends and I did a, a workshop. I did the breath work and the cold water immersion. Uh, we got my sisters in there, my brother in the ice bath. They also did the breath work. And then we also got my dad in the ice bath where he stayed for three minutes. And that was, it was like a cool thing of, like, oh, like I finally got my family involved. Like the people that you said closest to me that just think I'm nuts that know me as the weird kid growing up that you didn't even do well in school. Why are we going to listen to anything you have to say? But, you know, getting totally. in the cool thing. That shows that you like it as well. If you could sit there and teach your family right before your one year anniversary. I mean, yeah. that just shows how much you enjoy the teaching aspect. You're still passionate about the things that you do. Tell me, as you've gone down this journey, obviously jujitsu, I'm assuming at the time, and I'm assuming... When you go into jujitsu, sometimes you have this like goal of like black belt, you want to beat people, you want to win. How, how have you noticed that this breath work, what you teach now, has positively or negatively impacted your pursuit of growing and winning and dominating and, and all these different things? Uh, there must be pros and cons that come with it. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, well, like, so I guess when I came into jujitsu, because I had already 
wrestled in high school and college, like before that. And so I knew I just needed a physical out, like an outlet that, uh, you know, allowed me to get rid of energy in some capacity. And it was a thing that like, I ended up competing and doing it like a high level just by accident, just because I was there and all right, I'll do this tournament. Okay, I'll do that. Um, but I do feel that like it's, I've always kind of looked at it as a kind of meditation, but being able to focus on my breathing in the middle of rolls have definitely taken it to a whole different level because of while, especially in the beginning, you're fully present because of the fact that it's, you're so in fight or flight that it's just so everything's new. But then as you becomes a little bit more routine, there is still a possibility of your rolling and thinking about other things. And I feel that the breathing is always brought the brain back and like, okay, never mind. Let's go back into the body. How am I breathing right now? Which then translates to where am I holding on to tension? Where am I relaxed? And I feel that's definitely had a, like it shifted how like I roll. Um, but yeah, as far as goals and everything, I don't know if it's really changed any of that. I've always been in as kind of a more casual thing. The competing just seemed to have happened. And now I've kind of gone back into just training and taking it a little bit more now, because yeah, for me, it's always just been a way of meditating, a way of moving my body and staying in shape. And also the network that you gain from jujitsu is amazing. You get people from all walks of life. It takes a certain kind of person to go into the room, be humbled by getting beat up multiple times, um, and then keep on showing up. And as, especially where I train, uh, there's like a lot of really amazing people outside of you know, their role as jujitsu grapplers that, you know, a lot of them are successful family men, successful businessmen, successful in their careers and what they do. And so just the ability to gain advice from like these kinds of people, and you know, there's a commonality, you know, that it takes something for yourself to go into the jujitsu room, get beat up, still show up continually. And so when you're talking to these people, you're like, okay, I, I know what you say has some weight to it because of you've gone through this as a person as well. So outside of the jujitsu stuff, like the, the, how were you before you started doing this breath work and, and, you know, you can expound, like I'm using breath work yeah. as like a definition to define something that's kind of under, like, there's a lot of things that go into it. Meditation, a whole different way of thinking. Are, are you different in that way? Like, you know, I'm using jujitsu as kind of like a, like an example of, you know, I'm sure when you go into it, you're like, oh, I want to beat people. I want to win. Or at least that's what I would be going for. I had a friend in high school that he just got challenged to fight all the time. So he did jujitsu six days a week for like two and a half years mm -hmm. for like three hours a day or whatever it was. And he had open classes unlimited. And, and then after a while he was like, wow, like, I don't want to go into every room just thinking, I hope someone fights me. Like, that's all that he ever hope. He's like, I hope someone just tries to fight me. Yeah. And and that took away his motivation. What about in like your, your, what, what does success look like for you? I'm kind of interested in hearing like, what's on your horizon? What are you trying to achieve? Or do you not really care to achieve? Like, what yeah. does that look like? And how has it changed over the years? Yeah. And so I can feel like the, I look at like jujitsu, breath work, meditation, the various plant medicines I've done, like all these different things. It's just tools. I feel like you're, you're always the same person from like a spiritual level, that same thread of when you were a child to the day you die is all like the same thread, but then kind of gaining tools and operating this human mechanism a little bit better. And I feel that like, is like I was diagnosed with ADHD, like from school on. And like, I remember being at a Tony Robbins event and the guy put it really well, like being diagnosed with ADHD, like people with ADHD, it's like having a Ferrari brain, but you have the brakes of a bicycle. And I remember like that it resonated. And I feel that between jujitsu, breath work, meditation, is that it's provided stronger and stronger breaks for me. Because I do feel like my mind's always going. There's an overwhelming aspect to it. Like all the things, good and bad, as far as possibilities. And being able to just quiet a lot of that down is a very powerful thing. Being able to just, okay, like I'm not overwhelmed in this moment my mind is just racing, being able to breathe and calm that down. It's been like a very, very powerful thing. And it has, it's given me direction in life. And I feel like my, it's interesting because like my goals are never like financial. I, I love doing what I'm currently doing. I love expanding upon it. I don't want to just be a 
Wim Hof method instructor, breath work, meditation, ice baths are certainly part of everything I do, but I've always wanted to expand those horizons. And I just want to be able to share that, but not have to do anything else on the side in order to do that. And I feel in my life, I've been blessed that that's actually occurred and just kind of uh, adding an element of just more stability with that. So like, as far as making money, just like, hey, like, I want to be able to keep doing this and that it just keeps on just funding itself. And uh, yeah, that's like, that's what I have as far as goals, as far as like teaching this, doing what I do, um, because I know the impact that it's had for me. That's awesome, man. And yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the guys that went through it. And I don't want to go too deep into like the, what you're going to teach at B2B Live. You're going to be talking about how you can actually incorporate this, how you can incorporate the things that you teach. And I want to keep that for that time. And some of the guys that were just at that lead event know, and we had guys that went back like with a whole different perspective on their marriage. And you'd think, well, you just sat there and you breathed, which we did a little bit more than that. Or you went through this trying time. You talk about ice kind of being this pressure and it allows you to overcome something that's difficult that now gives you strength in other areas. There's a lot of things like that that were really impactful. And I'm excited for you to teach them at BDB Live. Yet for you also, like you've seen some of these massive transformations, like the ones that, at our event, for the guys that are going to come to the event, or even maybe you go to one of your online workshops or maybe a physical workshop of that of that capacity, what are some of the breakthroughs that you've seen either short-term or over a long period of time? I'm sure you have people now that have been following this or even you instructors that have been going through this for a while. What have been some of the benefits of the breathwork meditation, ice baths, et cetera? Yeah, and so what's interesting is that uh... – because I feel like the overall method between the breath work and the ice bath, it's a really powerful masculine feminine dynamic. And I feel what really attracts people is the masculine aspect of people see the ice bath and it's like, that's a thing I can conquer. I see people getting in there, staying calm. And so it attracts a lot of that mentality the people that want to conquer a challenge. And what I found is that the breath work kind of is the thing that comes in under the radar because for that, that's like the more feminine, a lot of surrender. You see a lot of emotional releases. And like, I remember one thing that really stands out, like as you asked that question, I remember it was, a, it was a two day thing I did in Slovenia. And there was one guy who came there who was clearly like, he drove a nice car, like had the good business, like made a lot of money. And on every time we did breath work, he had like a massive cry. And then like after all the breath sessions, I always ask if like, if anyone, if it, anything came up for them, because I do think there's an aspect of like, hey, I just dealt with something. I need to put this into words to help myself process it. And I remember as he was crying, he was like my whole life, like I was always taught to be the best student, the best athlete, the best in business, make the most money. And I did all of that, but no one ever taught me. And then he starts crying. No one ever taught me to love myself. And I was like, like, this is why I do what I do. I remember in that moment, it was like this, oh yeah, that's the reason. Because there is this, like a lot of us are, you know, and it's beautiful that there is something to looking in the future, making goals, trying to see those goals through. But then there is the like, oh, wait a minute, how am I right now in this moment? What's going on? How am I feeling? What's going right in my life? And a lot of people don't take that time. You don't have to dwell on it. It is important to go after goals, but it is also important to take pauses every now and then and be like, oh yeah, like I, I love my wife. I love my family. I have amazing friends. I do amazing work. And like that, it's really important to take a pause and recognize that before moving on. Because I do feel that if you take a pause, recognize that a lot of things are going right, then you can start moving on trying to achieve those goals and not trying to fill a void, but of like, oh yeah, I get to do these different things. And it is a giant perspective switch. And I've noticed it for myself. I've noticed it for other people. And for me, that's a, it's a big thing that, like, you know, to, to shift that mentality a little bit. So, and, and I, when I hear that you're talking about like this shift from, I need to, let me get this void filled. I have to get more of this to I, I'm recognizing all these things that are going really well in my life and out of that overflow, I'm going to go do more yes. of these good things that I'm doing, which is difficult. Yeah. I know that mo for most high achievers out there, one of the quotes that I took from a lot of the athletes that I've studied is that they hate losing more than they like winning. Yes. So they, they chase that winning success 
mostly because they just hate the feeling of losing so much. And most of the time, none of them can really enjoy their careers until after they're done. Yeah. They're done. It's a different section of their life. They can reflect back. And now they start telling everyone all the things they couldn't talk about. Because in competitive sports, you can't show that you're scared, weak, tired, sick, injured, any of those things, because then it's like something in the mind of your competitor that can help them beat you. They know that you're, yeah. you got that hurt leg, like the karate kid, like they're going to go in there and they're going to kick that same leg over and over and over again, or they're going to have a mentally upper hand on going, Oh, I think I can beat this guy because he's not at hundred percent. Whereas if they have that tough mentality or don't show any of that weakness, then they usually get away with the fact that people are intimidated. They're not showing any cracking, you know, like mm. you might see this in, in a, it, even a jujitsu thing like if someone's acting like they're not tired and someone who's feeling tired sees that it's going to break their spirits and there's wow. that fun i love that right like it's one of my favorite things in the world you know is to break people's spirits when it's in a competitive sort of nature wow. but then you can look back at your life and go like i ran from one thing to the next and not not none of it if you're not happy now you, nothing's going to make you happy which is yeah. something that kind of scared me is that you should be happy now with everything or nothing. And out of that happiness, go get more things. I remember one, a friend of mine once said like a drinking quote that was a pretty, I don't know if it's necessarily true, but it gave me a personal development insight. He said, drinking doesn't make you happy, but it can make you more happy. That's what he said. And I was like, that's so interesting, even though that's probably bad logic. I, I thought, yeah, if you're sad, drinking is going to make you more sad. Mm -hmm. And if you're happy, Drinking something might make you have the potential to make you a little bit more happy, but it will never be the actual main source. Yeah. It made me think of that with success as well, or achievement, or any of these things. It's like if I'm not happy living in the you know one bedroom apartment with my wife, though I'm still hungry to achieve more and know that I'm destined for more and I can see more and dream for more, if I can't also have peace and happiness in that arena, I'm not going to have it with fifty jets and fifty homes and. 50 cars because yeah they say people say oh it's better to cry in a lamborghini than in a honda civic or something like this and there's probably times where that's like partially true but when you're crying and something bad's happening you would literally light all the cars on fire and you yeah. wouldn't care and so i think there's some truth to that so i appreciate you sharing that you talked about plant medicine as well you can also comment on what i just said if you yeah. want but i i the plant medicine stuff is interesting let's get into that next yeah um, what's interesting, because of what you just said that, because of when you mentioned like that, yeah, drinking won't make you happy, but it could make you happier. It did make me actually like think about various like plant medicines, whether like, you know, ayahuasca, psilocybin, all these different things. Like they, they show you what's there that like, it will never, it'll never take a happy person and then like make them miserable. But if you're kind of like a, like a miserable person, like underneath, but you cram it and you put on a happy face, it's going to bring to light all these things that you've been cramming down. And I feel that like a thing, an element of truth that it shows. And I feel that just like the, uh, the gentleman who cried recognizing, oh yeah, no one ever told him to love himself. Like in that moment, there was probably a sadness, but then like by the thing coming to the light, it allowed for the thing to be healed and now for him to move into a different direction within his life. And I feel with within the right setting, within like the right intentions, using a lot of these different plant medicines can do that. They can show you where you're, where you're messing up in life, where you're trying to cut corners and maybe you're fooling other people, but you're always an observer of yourself. And so anytime that, you know, you've maybe cheated a friend to try to get ahead or whatever, like any little thing like that, your conscience is always aware of it. And even if it's not actively putting it in the forefront, it's there and it's causing mayhem in some kind of way. And I find that the plant medicines always bring those various things to light. They, they really put all the things that you bury in your subconscious up to the forefront and you get to then realize, A, hey, what I did then, maybe it wasn't right, but it also doesn't need to be the end of who I am. And now I can move forward in a different kind of way. But I do think that what it shows is like who you really are. And in seeing who you are, you can kind of, oh yeah, when I do that, that's out of alignment with who I am or how I want to be in the world. And so it's really, it's like a really effective tool to really bring a lot of those kinds of things to the light. 
as well as show you there's much more to life than a lot of, as I mentioned before, the things the eyes can see, the ears can hear, that there's like different realms that we can go to to access. And for me, it's been a mind blowing, powerful experience. So maybe define for some of the people out there what plant medicine is, some examples of yeah, uh, like, what uh, they are. Go ahead. Yeah, like the most, like, like if you think of like mushrooms or like psilocybin, uh, like ayahuasca, like a lot of things like various like psychedelics that a lot of people's perception is like, oh, but you're just tripping, you're hallucinating. But like there's a truth, like as I said, with the right set, setting, intentions, it shows you things that are there within yourself. It shows you higher versions of yourself that you can really access these deeper planes of existence. Um, but as I said, with the right set, setting, intention, and yeah, but it's like like the psychedelics, the things that maybe in high school, middle school, you were taught were drugs. And some of them, like as I said, like you just like anything, it's a tool. You can use a hammer to build a house and you can also destroy your house with that same hammer. That like, it's a tool that if you, you have to come into it with the right intention, the right kind of setting, maybe surround yourself with the right people, having some kind of expert involved as well. There's like all sorts of correct ways to do it. But I also see that there's wrong ways to do it as well that maybe offer a good time or don't offer the optimal experience. But there is a way to use these things and like as medicine that can show you different perspectives of yourself, of life. And it's a really powerful thing to get to witness, get to experience. I'm interested to see over the years, because we, we obviously have this like culture that's pretty bad. That's like drugs. Or we have these things that are told like these things are bad. These things are good. Mm -hmm. And one of my mentors once said, there's things that are legal that are wrong. And there's things that are illegal that aren't necessarily wrong. Yeah. And so it was like doing a U-turn on an empty street that says no U-turn is against the law. Yeah. But it's not necessarily like morally wrong, like besides the fact that you broke the law part, but it's like the action in itself isn't bad. And then there's other things that maybe would be a really bad thing that ne isn't necessarily illegal, yeah. but it could be really, really wrong. Like lying, for instance, doesn't really do anything good for you. But it's yeah. not against the law to lie every single day about every single thing. Yeah. And so in, inside that, I'm really interested as well, because there's this guy, Dr. Amin, I think his name is or something like that. And he studies the brain. And one of the biggest things that he did was like he took people that recreationally smoked marijuana and obviously marijuana is like a very small piece of like the what people used to call drugs and now is like medicine and all these things. And he showed it to do more dysmorphia to the brain than even someone who recreationally is drinking alcohol all the time. And people look at alcohol as like poison. So yeah. I'm very yeah. interested to see like the long term effects of all these different things because like you just don't know, you know, yeah. I think that's always been a hard thing for me is I'm like, oh my gosh, like what if all these people are actually like just all of a sudden gonna go like mentally insane, like their brain's rotting or something like that. Yeah. That's also a lack of education, by the way, on my part. Um, but what do you know about some of that stuff? And it's okay not to, um, because I don't know if they really understand that every single thing comes at a cost, right? It's like, if you lift weights, you have a higher chance of possibly probably hurting like a ligament or a joint or something yeah. like that, but at what benefit as well. Yeah. So I also understand that part. Can you speak to a little bit of the like, pros and cons and I mean, all that I'm, kind of stuff? I'm not like a scientist on any of these things. I just know like from personal experience and also like you look at recreational, either marijuana or alcohol use where people do these things every day. And for me, like I look at, if I do like a, some kind of psilocybin or ayahuasca thing, it's once maybe a year, once a couple times a year. And for me, I always look at it as like a reset. And I also am aware of the impact that they've had on me, my perspective of life and how things have dramatically changed. How I, I do focus less and less on material things and try to focus more and more on connections with people, trying to do what I feel are good deeds. And also a lot of things that I was like stressed about and anxious about when I was younger, like I had fresh perspectives on that from like a higher version of myself of, listen, you're not a terrible person. You don't need to beat yourself up. Like when I was younger, it was because I, maybe I slept in too much or wasn't as much of an achiever as I wanted. And this kind of higher perspective, like, listen, you don't need to, like, you're making it worse 
that it's not just that you like you did the thing, but now that you're beating yourself up about it every day, that's like where you're doing this damage to yourself. And so getting these like little perspective, these little nuggets of wisdom, because I feel that we all have that wisdom in us. Uh, and I do think that by some of these plant medicines put you in direct access with like that highest part of yourself. I feel oftentimes, whether it's mushrooms, psilocy, or, uh, ayahuasca, DMT, any of these things that I'm put in contact with a higher version of myself. I don't know if that's like a guardian angel or just me at the highest level. If you did everything right, this is what you can be. And it's always this kind of, hey, if you live your life in this way, it's always a gentle nudge in a different direction. And I feel that every time I do one of these ceremonies and I come out, that my life always changes for the better every time, even when I become aware of things that make me feel like a shitty person. Now that that awareness is there, I can change it. And like for me, I've noticed nothing but life improvements in so many different areas just because of the perspective that it's given me of myself. And what are some of these experiences like? They're all sounds different. I've never experienced any of these things yeah. before. And so uh, you've talked about even these like poisonous frogs last day, like what, yeah, like a few minutes. Yeah. I think even DMT only like a, like not that long e either. It's like 10 to 15 minutes, but it feels like you've been in there for like a lifetime. I remember the last time I did it as I was coming back into my body because there was this experience. It was like the experience of the oneness of all things. And I remember it was just like getting downloads of information that weren't in any human language, but this feeling of like, oh yeah. And then when I started to slowly come back into my body, I remember patting like, oh yeah, I'm a person. Like, it's like, you, like you go that deep out of it. And I remember once I did a, it was, I did a, it was a study of ketamine. So this was actually like, I did this with a, it was with like a hospital and it was for a study and they wanted to know what the effects of ketamine on the effects of people with schizophrenia were. And so they needed a control group. So I was part of the control group. And I remember I did the ketamine and like, so like they put me into an MRI, they injected in my veins. And I remember this kind of perspective where I was looking at myself. It was an out of body experience. And I remember this, this realization of, oh, like that's not who I am. That's the meat suit and how I get through this world. But like, that's not me. That thing will age and die and change in all these biological ways but that's not me. That's not what the essence of what I feel is me. And I remember then coming back into my body, getting done with the experience. And I remember like, you have a perspective like that. You, you walk differently, you talk differently because all of a sudden things like money, status, none of those things matter because none of those things are you. And it's one thing to say it, but it's another to actively experience it. And I remember afterwards, the doctor was interviewing me, making sure like everything was fine, but then also what did you experience? And I don't remember what it was that I said, but I remember it coming from this place of, got it, this body is not who I am. So like there's this, this fearlessness, this not even death could affect me because this isn't even who I am. And answering all the questions from that place. And I remember the doctor being, wow, I wish I could experience that. So like, yeah, uh, okay. we'll hook you up right here, man. We'll throw you in the machine. Yeah. I know, right? You, you have the access to the thing, but apparently for whatever reason, he wasn't allowed to do it himself. But yeah, this like this, you like all the different times I have, like little experiences like that, where we can all like read good nuggets of wisdom in all sorts of different areas. But I do feel that these various plant medicines like give you the direct experience, this direct experience of all these different things that sometimes maybe take years and years to like really implant into your nervous system where I've had things that, yeah, within 10 to 15 minutes of, oh, got it. This is not who I am. Oh, got it. You can be grateful even in the hardest of times. Oh yeah, like all that we're experiencing is all just like what human beings have discovered within the universe, but there's so much more that our human bodies can't even perceive. There's colors that our eyes can't recognize, sounds that our ears can't pick up, smell, all these things constantly happening, but we just as, you know, humans that are able to experience it, things that just like aren't able to be picked up within this 
human mechanism that I feel like psychedelics give you the perspective of like, hey, like that also exists. So chill out with all your very human goals. There are deeper spiritual things that you can directly experience, you know? That's why, is there anything that's like, like what are the rules on this stuff right now? Like, is there any rules anywhere or there's like not really a rule book for it? Meaning like, you know, I always think when people are out there leading these different retreats and doing all this stuff, I'm like, is that against the law? Mm -hmm. Like, are they allowed to do that? Like, what's the rules on that? So like, like, I know various things. I know with ayahuasca, there are various like, um, like the, the churches or whatever. It's like within their religious belief to use this as medicine. And so I know there are like exemptions with certain things. I know that the same kind of exists with mushrooms as well. Now, does everybody abide by that? I don't know. Uh, like as far as like, as you said, like the legal rules of it. Um, but I would like, if you are ever like new to this and like doing it with somebody who is experienced, I think is always important going into it blindly with no, like, oh, do I just take this thing? Okay, what happens next? Probably not the best way to do it because you will experience things that you don't experience in your day-to-day -day living, which could be scary on some level. And so just being with someone like, hey, that's normal. Like, this is what happens when you decide to take part in this experience. And so like, as far as, again, making sure you're with someone who you trust, who's experienced in some kind of capacity. Um, but yeah, like legally, uh, the waters are always a little murky on this kind of stuff. Some of it is like, there are things that are totally legal, totally okay. I know the combo that I, that you mentioned, like the frog poison, uh, totally legal. Things like hop A, which is like a tobacco snuff blown through the nostrils, legal. But yeah, some of the other things, uh, legal-ish maybe maybe not yeah, yeah. yeah but and, and it is interesting things are changing pretty quick on all that stuff but yeah that's it's an interesting perspective i'm excited for you to come teach at btb live and kind of break down some of this stuff even with breath work that is something that's controllable it's free it's something that people yeah. can do right away uh, also for the guys right now that are listening that want to get more connected to the stuff that you're doing i know some of the guys are even posting links uh, of they're like, oh, where's the Zoom for that breathwork meeting and all these things that you were leading? Yeah. So some of the guys have gotten connected to some of that. What's some of the ways they get connected to you as well as some practical format? Because I've talked about this before. You go learn this stuff, go to a workshop, which is great because you get the immersion experience. Yeah. There's nothing like it, but you don't have that workshop at your house every single day. So it's like, how do you stay plugged into something that gives you consistency so you actually do it until it maybe becomes your own practice. But all I know is that I went to a workshop years ago with you and it was like, it did not become a practice right off the bat. I didn't go home and go, Oh, here's my ice bath. Let me do my freaking rounds of breathing. Yeah. I, just, I went, wow, I learned a lot. I was like, Oh man, like I don't know how to practice this yet. And you have some formats to do that. How can they get connected? Yeah. So I make myself very easy to find my first and last name, Joey house, my last name, H A U S S. You can go to joeyhouse.com, uh, find me on the social medias. But as you, I think you may have mentioned earlier, I do a weekly thing and I'm going to start adding to it as well. But right now it's a weekly thing, Tuesday mornings, 9 a.m. Pacific time, where I teach uh, breathing mechanics. I go through the Wim Hof method breath work and I take it a little deeper than the, uh, than the Wim Hof method app. But as you said, like there's a, a thing, I always look at it like being a personal trainer where you could you know, you come to a person to take you deeper than you do it on your own. And so I, you know, I do workshops, I have the online stuff, but then as far as just like even free resources for people to do the breath work, the Wim Hof Method app, I think has uh, like the breath work thing, which I think is really good for just daily breath work sessions, because I think it's a little bit more mellow, doesn't take you crazy deep. But yeah, if you want to go a little bit deeper, Tuesday mornings, 9 a.m. You can find me at joeyhouse.com. And if you want to go even deeper, I have plenty of workshops and things of that nature where I take things even deeper than that. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much again for joining us on the B2B podcast. For I learned me. a lot. You got my, my wheels turning on so many different things. And I really appreciate it, man. I'm excited to see you out here in Austin. Last time I was in Florida. I know that some people go check out maybe some of your itinerary, follow you on social Maybe you're going to do a workshop near them or they want to fly to it. They totally should. It's 100% worth it. 
It's not just sitting there and like filling your mind with every fact and taking a test at the end. It's learning, but then experiencing. And you know, it's one thing to know something and it's a whole other thing to, to understand it. You can only understand it through experience. And the only way they can do that is through you at your events and workshops. And I appreciate it, man. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Thank you.